Hello and welcome everybody. My name is Ronan Trainer, and I'm the founder of Verve. Thank you so much for joining us today for our 2022 edition of the Future of Experience, which we're delighted to present in partnership with the Marketing Institute of Ireland. Today, we will delve into the developing virtual life scene, explore some of the key trends that we feel will be important in 2022, and aim to demystify the new worlds of Web3, the metaverse, and the connecting technologies emerging onto the scene. But most importantly, we will demonstrate how these trends will affect you and your brands in the coming months and year. We can say with confidence that live is back. There is absolutely no doubt that our audience and clients have been more than ready for its return. Our teams are back out in sight, in venues, in fields, and in your offices, building all the things we've been dreaming up over the last two years. Our experience over the past 24 months has evolved our expectations. The virtual world presents a huge advantage in that we can reach a much larger audience and one that is spread much wider geographically than ever before. We can deliver cost effectively and more importantly, sustainably. So virtual is here to stay. Moreover, as most of us now work within a hybrid model, our customer experience must also pivot to adapt to that hybrid model. We must endeavor to reach our digital audience in a manner that is true, meaningful, and just as engaging as with our face-to-face -face interactions. Advances in technology in the past five years have come on in leaps and bounds. But so where do we start? Web3, the metaverse, NFTs, interoperability, extended re reality, decentralization, the list goes on. What's more, we understand that it's important for us to concentrate where our mar marketing focus should be invested. And with complex concepts, it can be difficult to know for a brand where to start and where to jump in. With that said, the team here at Verve, along with the Marketing Institute, have been working hard to research, to mine and distill all the details so that you don't have to. This has enabled us to understand the trends that are most relevant and applicable to the work that we do and the ones that you should be focusing on. In our first panel, the developing digital and virtual landscape, Barry Muldowney, Head of Events at Verve, will be joined by an impressive group of experts. Joining Barry will be Helen Beecher, Group Digital Development Director at Omnicom Media Group, Adrian Weckler, Technology Journalist, and Meme Amwudiwe, one of the founding members of AI Group Evisort. In our second panel, led by Connor Wynne of the Verve Digital Team and joined by Sarah, Rebecca and Beth, we will take you through the future of experiential as we see it. What's new in the live world and where you should be focusing now to build fresh and impactful experiences. Our promise to you is to deliver today's session in under an hour. To kick off today's event, I'm delighted to welcome Liam McDonnell, Chief Exec Executive of Dentsu and Board Member of the Marketing Institute of Ireland, to say a few words. Liam, thank you for being here today. Over to you. Good morning and welcome to the future of experience, the metaverse and web 3.0. My name is Liam MacDonald and I'm a board member of the Marketing Institute of Ireland. On behalf of our chair, Gerard O'Neill, and the rest of our board, I'm absolutely delighted to welcome you to today's event, which is in partnership with Verve, the live agency. The Marketing Institute is a professional body for marketing in Ireland and its purpose is to support, educate, and empower marketing professionals to become the best that they can be at all times and the leaders of tomorrow, which I believe talks directly to today's event. Bringing experts from industry and further afield to share their insights is a vital part of the Institute's remit, assisting you to lead on topics that have significant societal, commercial and political implications. John Hegarty, the renowned UK creative, frequently quotes Roy Amara, who in the 1960s said, the impact of technology is overestimated in the short term and underestimated in the long term. Today's conversation about the metaverse highlights that very, very well. Web 1.0 with its copper wires, ISDN lines and very slow download speeds was initially terrible to the point where people thought it's all hype, but it soon evolved. As Web 1.0 was maturing, the chatter was then increasingly about the potential of mobile. But again, in the early days, Web 2.0 didn't deliver 
on its promises, but it sure has since then. So as we enter into the era of the metaverse, which for me is better described as Web 3.0 with 5G, virtual reality, augmented reality, and much, much more, we are entering into a new and hugely exciting phase, which our panel will now discuss. I will now hand you over to Barry, who will introduce today's panelists. Thank you, Liam. So today we're going to talk about the developing digital and virtual landscape. And I'm joined by Helen Beecher, Group Digital Development Director of Omnicom Media Group, Adrian Weckler, Technology Editor of the Irish Independent and the Sunday Independent. And joining us from the States is Meme on Woodyway, Executive Vice President of Evisort and co-owner of the African Museum of the Metaverse. So let's jump straight into it. This can be quite a complicated topic, so let's start with the basics. Web3 is something we keep hearing about. So Adrian, what is it and what do we need to know? Well, at the moment we have a landscape where you could describe a lot of the digital world we live in as being owned or run by big tech companies. So Google, Facebook, uh, Microsoft, TikTok, Snapchat. The idea behind Web3 is a more decentralized version of that, where you control a lot more of your own data. You retain a lot more of your own digital assets. You can move from world to world um, much more fluently. You don't have to log into things uh, as much. And that has spawned a whole uh, other ecosystem. It's tied in with things like cryptocurrency and NFTs, NFTs all which have the same basic idea uh, about being a lot more portable and a lot more flexible for you personally. Right. Helen, you work in the digital realm. How is this evolution of Web3 going to change our day-to-day -day lives, our corporate events, professional activities, or has it already in your instance? Well, I guess Web 3.0, is it's based on a concept of decentralization, just like um, we talked about here. But I guess one result that I'm really interested in is, um, as per kind of we just touched on there, is actually the ownership of data. Because I guess the sense, like I guess there's a lot of issues right now when it comes to, you know, uh, Web 2.0, where privacy, security and access to data, and I guess how some of the big tech players leverage your data in order to earn revenue through advertising off that. So, you know, I guess the, the concept of Web um, 3.0 means that, you know, we can own all, all of that data ourselves. We can, um, I guess, give permission to who we want to actually access it. And we can also potentially earn money from our own data, which is fantastic. So for me, I'm really interested to understand and to see how companies like Meta or Facebook have pivoted um, towards the metaverse, which I know we're going to be talking about today, as potentially a new way to kind of earn revenue um, as opposed to leveraging data. But I guess let's remember it's still essentially a concept of what the future of the web will be and how we'll operate. We're still in the very early stages of making this vision a reality. Um, and a lot of what we're talking about as well with Web um, 3.0 is actually the infrastructure that sits behind it. And it is a little bit complex and it is a little bit heavy. But I guess, um, you know, by leveraging the new technologies like blockchain that have emerged means that we can actually move towards a new version of the internet, which is hopefully going to be better. So I guess there are a few watch outs um, in getting towards this vision. I mean, do we even have the computing power to be able to deliver this reality? And I guess 5G and the conversation around that comes in here. And again, we don't know yet. So I know a lot of uh, these big tech companies are working very closely with telcos in different markets to be able to ensure that 5G can deliver the power to be able to deliver um, our, our new reality. Um, and also, I guess, you know, there's, as I touched on, there are some serious issues with Web 2.0 that we want to avoid in the future. So, you know, decentralization, um, you know, making sure we're privacy and secure um, as well. So I guess, you know, it's still up for debate. Will we actually be able to create this uh, new world and hopefully a, a better ecosystem? Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly very interesting. And uh, any chance we can make money off our own data, I think is a welcome one. Uh, Meme, I know it's bright and early where you are. So thank you for joining us. We can't talk about the digital world and the virtual workspaces without talking about the metaverse that Helen has referenced. We saw drinks companies uh, at the Super Bowl with their virtual bars, uh, clothing brands such as Gucci creating their own. Can you tell us a little bit about what exactly is the metaverse and is this something that we as brands should be starting to look at now as our next marketing endeavor? 
Yeah, most definitely. I mean, honestly, when we talk about the metaverse, as as Ellen was saying, it's very early. It's almost prematurely in, in our lexicon, kind of saying the metaverse, and that a lot of the infrastructure is still being built. But it's basically the idea over the coming arc of time that there's going to be this merging of the digital and the physical world, right? If you think about it, we already spend about half our lives in the digital world, even though we engage with it through a 2D screen that we're tapping, right? And so imagine when it gets more immersive, when you actually have kind of 3D holograms and actually VR when you're in that more as things become more digital as well. And so kind of in its current iteration, there are different kind of metaverses that exist today. You know, things like kind of Fortnite, you know, which are kind of more centralized, almost kind of gamified. But also what's interesting and where Web3 comes into it is there are different metaverses that are natively built on the Web3, on Ethereum in particular, right? And those are places like Decentraland, like Sandbox, which have already many corporates in there. For example, in the central land, there'll only be 90,000 spots ever. McDonald's has land there. JP Morgan has land there. You can actually go into their place in McDonald's and order a burger and have it come in real life. Um, and even do things such as, um, um, you know, there's some actually some countries have actually put up embassies there where you can get kind of government services as well. And so um, it's, it's, it's a pretty interesting space. But the way I frame it for folks especially when you think about your kids, right? Your kids who, you know, go online and take your phone and spend lots of money on kind of these digital items, right? And you think, why are they doing that, right? But you think about it, they've been locked up for a couple of years. Why do you wear clothes, right? You know, to show who you are to your friends, right? As a way of self-expression. And if you're engaging with your friends mainly digitally, it doesn't matter what you're wearing at home behind that screen. What matters is what you're wearing in the game. And that's why they're willing to spend money like that. And as we engage more digitally, that's, that's where opportunities are, are going to be, so... So you're saying we can stay in our tracksuits forever. Interesting. I will admit <laughs> I, I have actually been in Decentraland and it is a bizarre place, but just on the metaverse itself, Adrian, how do you actually access it? Do you access it through Facebook or Meta? Do you need a VR headset? How do you get onto it? Well, as Memi said, there are a lot of different pre-metaverse metaverses out there at the moment. For example, we don't have a giant metaverse as that Mark Zuckerberg uh, talks about. We do have things like Horizon Worlds that Meta has created. And within that, you can you know, set up a business meeting, you can play games, you can socialize. socialize. You can do the same thing on other things like Microsoft's Allspace or Verbella. I know the couple recently got married uh, through Verbella. But a lot of what we're talking about is kind of like a souped up version of Second Life, which any of your older uh, viewers will remember from about 15, 20 mm. years ago. And just like now, there were state agencies at the time spending money creating embassies in Second Life. Second Life is still going, by the way. I think it has about right. a, a, a million users. But, um, but so to your point, you know, how can you get into the metaverse? What do you need? At the moment, Mark Zuckerberg's uh, vision for that means using his Oculus mm. virtual reality headset. Now, th there are huge challenges with that. How do you make a headset, for example, that is powerful enough, that is small and non-dorky enough? Because the big problem with VR headsets is most people don't like wearing them for an extended a period of time. We know that Apple, for example, is likely to come out with an augmented reality headset, either later this year or early next year. But, you know, will we all agree to wear these things on our heads, which is Zuckerberg's vision? And if so, um, what will the apps be that are powerful enough uh, uh, and, to your point, let us trade or sell things? Mm. Yeah, I think that is the big point. Will we get to the point where we're accepting to put on the, the headset itself? Helen, uh, where do we see the metaverse and the real world actually intersect? Like, is it being used for meetings or purchasing or socializing? Like, what is its main functional use at the moment? And what advantages will it bring to us in the professional environment? Yeah, and I mean, that's a really interesting question. I think people are focusing right now on exactly developing the metaverse. How we're going to interact between real life and the metaverse is going to be probably a question for further down the road. Um, but, you know, it, it's going to be really interesting to kind of, I guess, try to crack that. I guess, you know, where we've evolved 
to and where we are right now, kind of, you know, evolutions have come out of gaming platforms, like we've mentioned already, Fortnite and Roblox. They've come out of trading platforms where people are trading cryptocurrencies or trades or stocks. You know, people kind of go into the metaverse for, for this particular reason to kind of, you know, buy um, and speculate and maybe, you know, buy a pair of Nikes and hope that they're going to increase in value and trade them at a later date. Um, also, collaboration spaces have kind of been the, you know, the starting point of our experience within the metaverse. So really, you know, the metaverse is going to give us an opportunity to create, engage with people, to speculate, to evolve. And for me, kind of it's how how brands will evolve within these spaces to actually continue to be able to consume and, and talk to their uh, customers and fans. So, you know, right now we've we touched on a few things. So we can be entertained. We can go and we can interact with concerts in Fortnite and Roblox. And, you know, it, these aren't just kind of pre-recorded, you know, um, souped up music videos. You can actually have your character interact with elements within um, some of these uh, executions. So again, look, they've been huge. It's Ariana, Ariana Grande and uh, Lil Nas X, etc. So there's been huge amount of money going into the production of these type of executions. But we can see kind of simpler versions even come out right now. Um, we can interact with our friends, obviously, through online games and communities and through our colleagues, like we talked about within um, Meta Workrooms. Um, we can, you know, shop and we can buy things within the metaverse already. Um, and for me, I'm particularly interested in kind of all those brand executions. Like, so there's loads of examples you can look up, but like Gucci did an amazing Gucci garden where they had a real life execution in Italy, but then they um, set up a, a version within um, a metaverse. Um, Disney are looking at producing three visual theme parks as well as setting up their own metaverse. Hyundai have done some interesting work within Roblox. Um, you know, Nike is kind of forefront of this. They've actually acquired um, like an AR creator company to be able to actually create um, virtual sneakers and merchandise and sell them through NFTs. Um, so loads of great examples there. And I guess what we're seeing with brands especially is that they're starting out by potentially working directly with these uh, platforms. But now they've kind of shifted to actually work working with developers. Um, so they don't need the permission of Roblox to actually go in and produce and set up a whole little area within there. It's a platform that allows brands um, to kind of go in and execute. So again, I guess it's early stages, but really exciting to see what's coming next. Yeah, that leads on nicely to my next question and your reference of Roblox and uh, anyone with small kids knows uh, they're constantly on it and my own son is constantly asking me for Robux, uh, which I'm declining because uh, he's not purchasing any, any rubbish within it. But it leads on to kind of cryptocurrency and it's probably one of the most identif identifiable elements of Web3. Uh, like we've seen cryptocurrency now on Revolut. Obviously, Coinbase has risen to fame over the last few years. And people are now dabbling in coins themselves, pretending to know what it is. And like crypto ATMs are now operating in the US. El Salvador has adopted Bitcoin as an official currency. Like Adrian, can you tell us, like, do you think we will actually be purchasing things with crypto at real events or in a retail setting anytime soon? Not soon, no. We, we might in five or six years time, but there are a few big problems that crypto has to overcome before you can walk into a bar and get a pint of Guinness with it, uh, for example. First of all, it's too hard and too expensive to convert it and in that context, in that setting. People talk about gas fees, for example, mm -hmm. uh, for, you know, for cryptocurrencies. It's also too volatile still. The, the price is still goes up and down too much, and that puts traders off. They don't want to feel that they're, you know, they're going to miss out if they accept Bitcoin or, or Ethereum or, or whatever it is. There's also very little security. If something happens to your payment or if you're a trader, there are no guardee, there's no regulator. You know, you can't uh, appeal to mm. anyone for that. Um, it might be as simple as you losing the password to your, your crypto wallet. On the other hand, there are positive signs. So Stripe, for example, um, has come back into the crypto world. It abandoned it uh, two or three years ago, uh, but it now says that it thinks it's going to be a mainstream. That crucial volatility in the price is starting to ease off. So the price of a Bitcoin is not going up or down by 20 or 30 percent typically daily. That's going to encourage um, uh, traders as well. So the long term uh, prognosis for crypto is very good. Institutionally, there's a lot of acceptance of, us, uh, of it now. Most big banks 
uh, are dabbling with or have some portfolio product or service that will offer a spread across stable coins uh, or crypto. So the long term is good, but a pint of Guinness and a bar tomorrow, no. No, okay, interesting. Uh, and your reference about security, um, like Meme, with any sort of online finance and payments like comes with the security side of it, which Adrian has referenced, and the term blockchain gets bandied around a lot. Like, what is blockchain? Where is it used? And how does it actually relate to crypto? And um, what is its importance in the grand scheme of Web3? Yeah, I mean, blockchain's importance in the grand scheme of Web3 is almost everything. It's really what kind of allowed this whole kind of uh, revolution from the start. And so really what blockchain enables, and, and at a high level, what it is, is basically almost a computer or basically keeping a ledger across multiple different devices kind of globally, right? So instead of you know having one bank that keeps track of a ledger and then is keeping track of what money's coming in and out, you're able to actually decentralize that tracking of the ledger so that it's public, everyone can see what's going in and out, but it's also confirmed across multiple devices globally, which makes it, you know, um, one would hope to be uh, immutable, right? It can't be changed, can't be kind of really brute forced. And what that enabled past that then is basically peer-to-peer -peer transactions without a trusted third party, which kind of changes everything, right? Because the whole reason you have banks and the whole reason you have a whole financial system is because people want to do things with each other and don't trust them, right? And if you're able to kind of create on the blockchain where anyone can have their own bank account, really, just by having your own kind of seed phrase and then can transact with other people globally with no centralized authority controlling it, you know, that's what the blockchain kind of really brought to it. And then I think it kind of moving out to Web3 in the metaverse like the beauty of Web3 makes it makes it better than Web2 is the idea that, you know, if you store things on the cloud, you know, that's great. If your computer breaks, it's still on the cloud. But like if Microsoft goes under or like Microsoft doesn't like you anymore, then, you know, they can just cut it off. Right. And if you store it on your computer, you know, that's great. And, you know, you don't have to worry about Microsoft liking you. But, you know, if it breaks, then it's, it's kind of gone. Right. But with the blockchain, because it's still stored kind of on your device and you're kind of doing it, but it's also in this global network that's kind of, you know, decentralized, it, it allows for kind of almost that uncensorable, you know, kind of idea and being able to store that that kind of deeper level where it's both, you know, has the benefits of it being on your computer and the benefits of it being in kind of almost a cloudy network. And so that's the technology behind it. Um, I didn't really do it justice in that description. There's really a lot uh, more to kind of talk about and say, but, you know, uh, at, at a high level, that's kind of, you know, where, where blockchain fits into things. No, I think it was a pretty good description. It's blockchain is kind of exciting and scary at the same time where you're cutting out the middleman but then you are that middleman controlling everything so if if you get it wrong or send your money to the wrong person it's gone forever um, but that kind of leads on to my next question like we've we've already spoken about paying for physical items via crypto uh, but what about digital ownership and its value in this digital world we've all heard about nfts um, it doesn't mean we all know what they mean um, and it's things like apes being sold for hundreds of thousands of dollars but is there any other value in this technology beyond digital art? So Adrian, I'm going to come to you for this one. Yeah. Like, what is an NFT? Like, what does it do? Yeah, so an NFT is essentially a digital asset or a contract to a digital asset. And as Memi was explaining uh, very eloquently there, one of its key uh, strengths is authenticity. So if you want to verify or anything or validate something, an NFT is seen as a way to, do, to doing that. So it's, at the moment, it's quite popular in digital art because it establishes a chain or a link, a formal association to a, a piece of, di of digital art. It's a little bit more complicated uh, than saying that it gives you copyright because it often doesn't. A lot of sports uh, organizations and leagues are now trying to mint their own NFTs. They're trying to encourage fans to, to, you know, to, to monetize their association with their clubs. But the big strength could be in things like verification. So you could see you know, areas like uh, medical histories, passports, driver's license. I mean, I think in, uh, in San Marino already has an NFT COVID uh, passport. That's right. the system uh, that they used. Anything that involves supply chain as well, complicated um, processes where verification and authenticity is very important. That's 
probably the future of, of NFT. At the moment, it's kind of Paris Hilton and John Terry uh, <laughs> selling uh, NFTs and Board Ape Yacht Club, which now, by the way, go for about a quarter of a million each. Right, it's okay. Not the mere 30 or 40,000 yeah. that you and I could have dabbled in. Um, <laughs> Can I, we dabble I'm, in jo that? I'm joking. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, so, so that's the future we think of NFTs. I think they have a good future, but they're tied into everything we've been talking uh, about today. If Web3 takes off, if the metaverse uh, takes off, if crypto continues to be steady, there isn't really any question that NFTs will be a thing in future. Right, interesting. Uh, Meme, uh, do you think NFTs will, can actually be used in real life events? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I think that when, when you think about using some of these things in real life events, there's there's multiple ways of thinking about it, right? There's somewhere, you know, just art. There's somewhere folks have used NFTs, for example. There's this one, you know, for like, I think, um, for like a golf ticket. And everyone who bought the NFT put the money towards, they actually bought a real life kind of golf course and country club. And then by having the NFT, which you paid for the, go uh, the golf course and country club, you now have kind of access to it, you know, directly. And there's also, I mean, I'm, I've got a legal background, right? There's, there's a lot from the whole perspective of it can make kind of ownership of physical materials and the transfer of that ownership, you know, much more visible, much more transparent, much more clear. Um, and so there's kind of, there's, there's, there's things from that perspective too. Um, and then, I mean, I think when, when you think about NFTs kind of as um, uh, just just from like music or kind of any other kind of, you know, uh, thing where it's creators, right? That whole cutting out the middleman also is here, right? And so instead of having, you know, a music piece where, you know, a record company is taking 40 or 30% of the money, you know, just for getting out, even though everyone listens to the music for free anyway, we all know that, right? Um, you know, you can just sell it as an NFT to one person who sees the value of it in millions of dollars, right? Um, and then that person owns it, can sell it over time. And then if they sell it for more, hard coded in that, you don't need lawyers for royalties, right? Hard coded in the NFT is the money coming back to you in future sales, right? Because it's all co it's all kind of within there. And so I think that it's going to have, it can have, uh, it can at least have a lot of effect throughout different kind of industries um, uh, if, if kind of utilized correctly. But it's, it is really early. But I mean, the idea of creating a scarce digital object, once again, can be kind of uh, transformative. And so yeah, it's, I think a lot of what we've talked about is is at the early stages, but is so exciting around what is potentially coming down the road with regards to the virtual, but also the physical world. Um, but we're, we're coming close to the end of our time here. And before I let you go, our Future of, of Experience webinars are always about predictions and helping our audience and ourselves understand what's coming next. So I'd love to hear some quick fire predictions for the future, let's say the next 12 months of Web3 from our panel. Uh, and if you were our audience today, what would you start engaging with? And I'd like to start with Helen, please. Right, well, I guess predictions, I think, like from what I've been looking at, there's a lot of money being pumped into the development of Web3. So you're going to hear a lot about it. But I guess like we talked about, it's the early stages. So I guess my prediction or my hope is that um, we're going to see a lot more kind of concrete implementation um, behind the theory. And I think in that process, we're going to learn an awful lot about what is practically possible or not. So I think it's just about the learnings that we're going to take within the next 12 months. And I guess if uh, if I was going to talk to our audience and a, a bit of a takeaway, I guess the audience I, I'm talking to all of the time are, you know, brands and marketing managers. And I guess, you know, you might feel a little bit daunted, as we all do within uh, this world of uh, Web3 and Metaverse. But I guess what I'd encourage you to do is just to continue learning. Um, you know, how can you do that? I mean, you can find out how your customers are beginning to explore the metaverse and um, what, you, what your competitors doing and um, build knowledge within senior levels as well within your businesses to kind of make sure that they're kind of keeping track with this evolution. And it's not going to be a surprise to them when you turn around and want to actually kind of explore something and, um, you know, talk to your agency teams about what they're seeing as well. And I guess expect unpredictability because um, it's an evolving area and, you know, there aren't any standards um, as we may have had in previous kind 
kind of worlds where we could do marketing. Um, I guess maybe find a, a teenager or a child or a nephew or a son or a, a niece and um, get them to show you how they play Fortnite and Roblox. I think it's probably the quickest way to actually jump in and get a little bit of an understanding. Um, but really to kind of reassure people as well, look, you know, from my perspective, kind of working within an agency and working with brands, marketing principles are the same. They're not going to change. So that won't go away and we'll just be operating within um, different either virtual or real worlds or blended worlds. Yeah, great advice. Thank you very much, Helen. Adrian? I, I look for two things. First of all, the confluence of Web3 into typical services that are coming through. For, in Ireland, for example, there's a new social networking platform called Wavelength by, from a guy called Niall O'Reilly, and that's based on a know your customer uh, principle. But the, the fact that someone like that is, is trying to create new services, incorporating what is essentially a, a Web3 sensibility is kind of interesting. And the second thing I'd look for is regulation and regulatory influences. I don't think there's any way that the European Commission in particular and other regulators around Europe are going to be able to see the emergence of some of the key principles of, of Web3 and blockchain, particularly where it rhymes with things like data privacy and ownership of your own data, and not themselves get idea, ideas of how to introduce new regulation into the way that the rest of us do business. So I'd look for those two things. Thank you, Adrian. And final word to Meme. Yeah, and um, I guess my, my advice to folks would be, you know, with this whole metaverse and NFT stuff, it is very early. Um, but I personally kind of look for even kind of some patterns, right? And so when it comes to kind of the entry point into the metaverse, I do think that, you know, keep an eye on these decentralized uh, kind of worlds, even though the metas and the Xboxes of the world will be creating their own platforms. The fact that you can actually have ownership in some of these decentralized places, I think will always kind of keep them, uh, you know, a little bit afloat. And I keep an eye on the central and something I always think about is, you know, people were yelling about how is a crypto punk $20,000 in early, you know, 2021. And now it's, you know, like a half a million dollars, right? And even though it isn't the best looking NFT and better ones come out all the time, you know, a lot of this stuff on the blockchain and being old, being their first OG, you know, is kind of important because, you know, this is kind of recorded, you know, on the blockchain. So I think some of the, some of these ones, even though the prices look crazy today, uh, they, they might be kind of crazier tomorrow. And, you know, having a metaverse footprint, I think will be like having a, a website down the line. So. Brilliant. Thank you, Meme. I'd just like to thank our panel again. Uh, Helen Beecher, Group Digital Development Director of Omnicom Media Group. Adrian Weckler, Technology Editor of the Irish Independent and the Sunday Independent. And Meme on Woody Way, Executive Vice President of Evisort and co-owner of the African Museum of the Metaverse. Thank you very much for joining us. And now up next is our Trends video that our Insights team have been working on for the last few weeks. Trending. In a world where AI, the Internet of Things and social media reign supreme, it can feel impossible to know what's in before it's out again. Here's our breakdown of the best to help you breathe fresh air into your values, break the boundaries of the market and make moves that push you to the top of the leaderboard. First up, let's take a look at the top event and experiential trends that are shaking it up so far this year. It's been a tough few years of pandemic living and event attendees are raring to go. The Roaring Twenties are back and the people want parties that put Gatsby to shame. With sellout festivals, concert tours, and a two-year backlog of award ceremonies, launches, and big get-togethers, we are live and we couldn't be happier about it. Marketing Insider Group said it best. Sustainability and corporate responsibility will be key for events run in 2022 and the foreseeable future. The sustainable event is here to stay and best practice will include responsible builds, careful catering, and carbon efficient transportation. But just because live is back doesn't mean virtual has disappeared. With the cost efficiency and carbon limiting benefits of virtual events helping brands to live their values authentically, as well as the convenience of joining them from home, hybridizing events is the newest addition of the new normal. Think multi-camera presentations and mixed reality conferences. Step inside the world of Stranger Things, get into the mind of Van Gogh and be enveloped in the Burberry brand. Finally, we can try a taste of a different world again. Encouraging community, inviting interaction, and building brand loyalty. Diving deep into a brand experience is unparalleled for creating an emotive connection with consumers. Consumers not only desire personalized experiences, they expect them. We're seeing a rise in asks to build enhanced personalization into events. 
From personalized RFID entranceways to unique event schedules, event maps, and swag. The availability of technology is providing opportunities to wow guests and collect even more information. In 2020, 96% of consumers increased video consumption. And in 2022, it's estimated that the average person will spend 100 minutes per day watching videos. Stats also show that 90% of viewers want more video from businesses. With TikTok, YouTube, YouTube Shorts, Facebook and Instagram Reels, LinkedIn Stories and so many other options available, video is the best possible way to get in front of your customers on a daily basis. TikTok is now one of the most visited domains in the world with a massive 1 billion plus audience. And speaking of trends, TikTok is the machine, generating endless hooks to capture any occasion or need for all kinds of communities and audiences. But TikTok is not the only platform we're seeing content creation helping businesses. Just look at the stats on influencer generated content strengthening brands. According to the Institute of Practitioners in Advertising, after the pandemic hit, the industry saw a 20% decline while influencer marketing saw a 46% increase. In 2017, influencer marketing was worth about $1.7 billion. By 2021, that had grown to a whopping $10.24 billion. 75% of consumers have said that they plan to use QR codes moving forward. As a contactless solution, QR codes have enjoyed a resurgence in the past two years. We've seen some pretty creative uses from brands like Pizza Hut, and Psy Games, who celebrated the anniversary of their Princess Connect Redive game with a drone show. Moving into the world of sponsorship, we're seeing brands focus their eyes on the horizon, building longer term sponsorship contracts with their partners. Brands are gravitating towards longer term deals with personalities, teams, events, and corporate partners who share their values and share their audience. Earlier this year, we saw KPMG move to extend their long standing sponsorship agreement with Leona McGuire. We also saw Irish Life take a title sponsorship on Dublin Marathon. There are heavily women-oriented sponsorships coming online this year, with the Women's Soccer and Rugby World Cups leading the charge. With sponsorship deals like that between O2 and the English women's rugby team emerging, their potential success could result in greater commercial interest ahead of the tournament. We're also seeing a spike in the popularity of micro-mobility sponsorships. McKinsey estimates that the shared micromobility market could reach $300 billion to $500 billion globally by 2030. So think city bikes, scooter schemes, and maybe even segways. It's time to get your brand moving. GWI reports that consumers are feeling daring, more adventurous, bolder, and more empowered than in previous years. They also ask consumers to list three things that have become more important to them in the past year. And a whopping 39% face treating oneself and indulging in the top three. Some brands like Lexus and PlayStation are leveraging this with YOLO campaigns challenging the norm. In 2020, in the early stages of the pandemic, there was an attention boom. All eyes were on screens for info about COVID-19 and we were seeing record-breaking TV broadcast numbers. France saw 35 million viewers tune in to one of their presidential addresses. However, after a boom, there inevitably comes a bust and the attention economy is reflecting that. Tying in with themes of attention deficit and information overload, content must now be extremely gripping to stand out from the crowd. Have questions about any of these trends or how to apply them? Reach out and we'll be happy to help. Welcome back. I'm Connor Wynn. I work in the digital department here at Verve. We've obviously seen a massive focus on digital over the last couple of years, at a time where we relied on it the most. This has undoubtedly pushed people to use the technology in more progressive and creative ways. On panel one, we introduced the various different elements of Web3, including crypto, NFTs, blockchain, and we also touched on components of the metaverse. I know it was already referenced, but both are at the early stage of adoption, and I kind of referred to the dial-up era. Um, but it's important that we can understand this and see how it applies to us going forward. At Verve, we're always looking at new and exciting ways to create unforgettable experiences. So in this panel, we're going to delve deeper and explore the future of Experiential. Joining me today in the panel is Rebecca Roach, Senior Sponsorship Director. We also have Sarah Byrne, Account Director. And lastly, dialing in from the UK, we have Bethany O'Brien, Production Director here at Verve. So to kick things off, we're going to chat a bit about sponsorship. Um, in terms of traditional and digital 
is there really much of a difference at the moment? And, you know, we talked about the COVID era over the last two years has been a massive reliance on digital. Have you seen this kind of seeping in? And what do you think will kind of be the mainstay going forward? Yeah, great question. I think overall sponsorship is seeing a significant period of change. We've relied on digital so much over the past two years that naturally our audiences are now asking for more unique, bigger, better experiences, um, whether that be online or in person across music uh, and sports sponsorship. And I think uh, the journey to mixed reality is really accelerating this and brands are already, I think, responding to that and are showing up in kind of unexpected ways. So um, I think if done right, fans can get a more connected, enhanced experience and then be it rights holders or brand sponsoring events, they get access to the fans um, in a more enriched way. So it's a win-win for everyone really. And then likewise for the investment, there's just a bigger return on ROI. Um, I've seen uh, recently at South by Southwest, Blockchain Creative Labs, they were really clever um, and they showed up as a main sponsor. So for them, ultimate win, they had access to a brand new community and they were just really able to shepherd them into the era, era sorry, of Web3. Um, and then also focusing on the technology itself. You guys know I love festivals. So <laughs> with Tomorrowland, they've really just nailed it um, towards improving the festival goers experience. So through RFID, so that's kind of like a simple chip within their wristband, the festival goer can just buy food with a tap, access areas with a tap and then say we met across the festival we just need to tap wristbands <laughs> and then we can just touch base afterwards so yeah I love that one. And then NFTs, um, I know that was touched on in the last panel, but again, it's a really important one uh, for anyone working in sponsorship, so get involved. Um, and I'm gonna read this one off. Uh, I just thought it was pretty uh, mind blowing. So Nielsen reported that blockchain companies are strongly investing in sports sponsorship um, and they forecast it's gonna reach 5 billion in 2026. So this represented a projected 778% increase in sports sponsorship wow. from the crypto blockchain. I know, mm -hmm. and NFTs as well. So, Connor, like we were chatting about this just before and you have a way better way to explain it than me. I suppose one example that I love is NFT is ticketing. And yeah. you said South by Southwest. I know South by Southwest used that in their last conference. Uh, Live Nation are now rolling it out for some of their tours and concerts. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then, yeah, the sports organisations, I know UFC have been like one of the early adopters at that stage as well. It's kind of combining these traditional experiences and the, this new virtual element and tying it all together. And it'd be interesting to see how it's deployed. It's definitely very early on, but um, yeah, I, I think that kind of does tie in maybe to my next topic, which is the metaverse. And we see companies and creatives alike now using like these virtual spaces to collaborate and you know to have your, your Monday meeting or whatever it may be. Beth, I'm gonna to come to you on this. Um, can you tell us about how this may come into our day to day or some examples that uh, you've been looking at? Yeah, definitely. Um, I guess a way to look at the metaverse is to frame it as a cyberspace. So we're all so familiar nowadays with Zoom and Teams meetings, um, but the metaverse takes virtual meetings and reality to the next level. Um, it creates a kind of world in which you can exist in working groups. Uh, you can become a bot or an avatar. And I guess communicating in a more interactive and in some ways a more lifelike way. Um, a good example of this is Ben Francis, who is the creator and owner of the, of the brand uh, Gymshark. He's really well known for conducting meetings on Horizon workrooms. Um, and the functionalities of something like Horizon means that you can meet as an avatar, you can have conversations, you can sketch, draw and kind of map out projects on a virtual whiteboard. Um, so I feel like with the Zoom fatigue narrative, the metaverse is going to offer us this new and I guess more engaging way to feel part of a team. Yeah, for sure. I think Horizon Workrooms is a great example of uh, like a virtual workspace. Um, maybe a more brand focused uh, platform is the Centraland. I know it was chatted about earlier on, but we've seen it being used for like product launches um, or an external or an extra part of a, of, of a let's say, a, an event or, or a launch. And my personal favorite is a platform called Spatial.io. And it just reminds me of these um, old school chat rooms, but it has that added so, uh, personable uh, feeling to it now that people are using their Oculus or your avatar and engaging them directly. Um, so, Beth, is there anything else, I suppose, in the world of virtual spaces that's, uh, that you'd like to touch on? 
Yeah, I guess we've just seen this huge increase of the usage of these platforms such as Horizon. Um, and I think, in my opinion, it'll only increase more as the need for collaboration from afar becomes greater. Um, and I guess the huge, the, import, the hugely important topic of sustainability, um, as we focus on saving the planet, we want to ensure everything we do is sustainable. Um, and I guess the use of these virtual workspaces and the metaverse equate to less travel, less consumption, and a decrease in carbon footprint. Yeah, that's actually a great point in terms of maybe uh, global platforms or a global audience bringing everyone together under one roof um, and reducing that carbon footprint. Um, Rebecca, I'm going to touch on sustainability. I know yeah. it's a, a hot topic <laughs> yeah. in sponsorship at the moment. Um, so yeah, and Verve, obviously we're an ISO accredited agency. So it's yep. top of our minds at all times. Absolutely. In the world of sponsorship, <laughs> um, does, yeah, does digital uh, have a role to play in terms of sustainability, sponsorship? Yeah, I think, um, so firstly, yeah, I think brands overall really want to invest um, and make better choices uh, with that investment. So I suppose partner with purpose, if I can try sum it up. And then I think Beth as well, like you touched on it. So I think extending the technology, um, we can really create opportunities to reduce waste and overall consumption. So for me, the key is actually committing to making this change happen. We hear a lot of brands going, you know, we are sustainability focused, but you know, what are you actually doing? As, you know, for yeah, me. So yeah, I kind of want to see that and I think it's going to be really cool in 12 years time to go back to a brand that we're working with and see kind of where they started and you know how far they've come and I think a big one albeit ambitious um, Diageo are a really good example of this so they've um, said that by 2030 they want to make sure they make a positive impact on the world in some way okay. um, so a part of this um, and something that kind of worked with them on they partnered with the Aviva Stadium um, to reduce single-use plastic. And then with that, they owned the reusable cup and designing their brand portfolio across this. So the consumer kind of gets this commemorative piece with them. And then also you're reducing single-use plastic. So that's just a win for really yeah. everyone yeah, involved. Yeah, really and then I actually have a video to kind of show, I suppose, how digital <laughs> are going to bring this in. So um, yeah, digital is definitely enhancing how your brand can extend this reach. And um, so if you want to pop it up there, um, so on-site high highlighted a great example of an extended reality company that collaborated with Madison Square Garden to bring the commemorative cups to life through augmented reality. So basketball fans, like they bought the drink and then they had a chance to unlock this exclusive content. And then I was kind of having a look at the uh, stats after and there was an overall usage of uh, two minutes dwell time. So personally, I think that's super impressive and it just shows how far you can bring a sustainable piece if you invest in it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's a really great video, Rebecca. And I think to your point, um, committing to making change happen is something that's really important yeah, to our definitely. audiences today. Um, I think if you look over the last two years, um, consumers are really examining the brands that they're engaging with and want to interact with ones that have the same uh, core values as, as them. And sustainability is something that's top of mind for everybody. Sarah, I want to have you. Um, I know brand activations is your area of expertise. <clears throat> Is there any digital trends you've seen popping up? Is there any examples of projects you might highlight in terms of <laughs> being innovative or eye-catching? Yeah, great question, Connor. Um, and I suppose it's safe to say that brands have really had to think outside the box when um, talking to their consumers over the last uh, two years and how they um, connect with them. And I suppose this technology bandwagon is what we're seeing brands really jump on board with. Um, I have a great example of H&M. Um, they have developed these high-tech recycle bins that are located in their um, stores. And it's really simple for the consumer. All they have to do is donate their unwanted clothes um, any brand into these H&M bins uh, and H&M then recycle them into textile fibres and reuse them in their new collections. And, and I suppose the benefit for the consumer is they're recycling their clothes um, and when they put them in, a QR code comes up on the bin um, and the consumer can scan it and they're entitled to 15% discount um, off their next H&M pur purchase. Yeah, so I think it's a really nice uh, way of marrying um, technology, sustainability and of course consumer values as well. And another great example I have is uh, fashion giant Balenciaga partnering with Fortnite, um, two brands that you would never, I suppose, come across um, before this. Um, but basically, players of the open world video game can purchase or could purchase digital outfits uh, inspired by real life Balenciaga pieces from a virtual boutique um, on the game. And um, the hub was live for a week, so players could, you know, interact with each other, try on the clothes, and also add the brand's merch to the to their inventory. 
countries. Um, they made this, uh, I suppose, a really hybrid experience because consumers could then go online to the Balenciaga website or to certain stores and and purchase certain elements. Um, and those people who did purchase those 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 clothes could also unlock uh, unlock them on Fortnite. So it was a complete okay, full yeah, circle. Yeah. So it kind of um, goes back and forth. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, and I suppose the partnership went one step further um, and created a really slick digital out of home experience, which was a 3D billboard that popped up. In, in London, New York, Tokyo, and Seoul. So, you know, just one example of how brands are really embracing that virtual world. I suppose another massive digital trend we have to mention here uh, is augmented reality, um, I suppose, and the technology um, that it merges the real and virtual worlds yeah. together. Uh, one brand that has invested really heavily in this is IKEA. And in 2021, we saw them launch their IKEA Studio app. Um, and it's just a really simple way for consumers to, I suppose, design entire rooms from the, from the comfort of their own home. Um, the app offers services such as 3D renders, uh, measurements. Um, you know, you could plot where you want the different furniture, change the colours of the walls. Um, you know, just a, a full sort of um, 360 experience um, and consumers then had the ability I suppose to um, like I said redesign redesign their space and then send it to, to others for approval um, so I suppose AOR is popping up everywhere uh, in our in our everyday lives as consumers and Beth I know you looked into this uh, for uh, and I have an example of fashion week last year yeah, I think there's a number of um, different mediums in which we can utilize digital assets to kind of connect those physical environments. And augmented reality, AR, is a fairly cost effective way to create impactful content for consumers. And we do see it a lot across fashion and lifestyle brands, kind of bringing to life physical assets and events through the means of AR. Um, I guess, for example, yeah, Snapchat did endorse Fashion Week last week, uh, last year even, and created these lenses for Paris, Milan and New York um, and essentially these extensions of reality are capturing the imagination of consumers and bringing to life events which they might not otherwise ever attend in person and I think to sum up on that we we just our expectations now are just higher than ever we want more we want what we had previously pre-pandemic and some of the enhanced elements that we've now experienced since then. We've seen a huge rise in technology across our everyday lives and then therefore this very much translate into the events and brand industry. Yeah, I think the, the return of the QR code has played a big role in augmented, augmented reality making its comeback. Um, thanks very much, Beth, Sarah, and Rebecca. I wish we had more time to continue, but I'm afraid it's all, all the time we have uh, for today. Uh, but we can't finish off without getting our panel of Vervi's hot takes. Um, let's hear everyone's quick fire predictions for the future of experience. Um, I'm going to jump in first and give my two cents. Um, NFTs going to jump on the bandwagon. Uh, I think the ticketing example for me is just brilliant. And again, I know they re uh, refer to it on panel one, but virtual ownership is going to be massive. And NFT, uh, NFTs really enable us to do that. Um, so, Sarah, I'm going to come to yourself now. What's your uh, take? Uh, I think I'm going to go for the extended reality. Um, the idea of merging virtual and real worlds, worlds together, I think, is a really big bet for brands in the not too distant future. And um, I think post pandemic, we've really seen consumers crave that immersive experience. And I think extended reality is just another way for brands to deliver that to their consumers. Thanks, Sarah. And Bethany, what about yourself? I'm going for sustainability. Um, as Sarah said, not only does the metaverse and extended reality offer capabilities to spread the message further and wider, um, this tech is having a hugely positive impact on our planet. Um, I think offering any kind of digital option for a global event is a sustainable approach and something definitely to consider moving forward into a post-pandemic world. Thanks, Beth. And finally, Rebecca. What's yeah. your prediction? Um, so I think the future of sponsorship, it's going to be dominated by focusing on fans and how we leverage technology to actually unite them, not separate them. So just really embrace it. And I think we can just really remove geographical barriers. So I think if you're uh, in the pub or at home or in the stadium itself, it's going to be a big turning point in the industry. Thanks very much, Rebecca. Uh, once again, thank you for joining us. And I'll hand you over to Ronan now for the final note. Myself and Oscar would like to thank you all for joining us for what has become our annual exploration in the future 
of experience. FERV and Marketing Institute of Ireland are delighted you tuned in to hear about what's coming down the tracks. We began today with a welcome from Lee McDonnell, followed by a quick fire video that touched on the trends which we consider important as we progress into 2022. Then, we received expert analysis on the developing digital and virtual landscape from our panel of experts. My thanks to Helen Beecher, Adrian Weckler, Meme on Woody Way, and moderator Barry Muldowney, who gave us insight and clarity on topics which are often opaque. I'd like to thank my own team, Verve's own industry experts who took part in our second panel discussion. Beth, Rebecca and Sarah, three powerhouses in Verve, along with Connor, our Web3 expert, supplied examples which we hope will help you put theory into practice. I trust that you found the time which you gave us useful and that you picked up at least a nugget or two on how the future of experience could work for you and for your customers. Big thanks to the team behind the scenes our event producer, Neve, supported by Matthew, our director, Rachel, Mary Therese and Monica in the Marketing Institute, the talented crew and team from CT Solutions, our valued AV partners, and the venue in the RDS. Before we leave you, a final word of thanks to you for continuing to trust Verve with the creation of your special projects. We look forward to working closely with you to turn the challenges your brands face into opportunities and into successful outcomes. This year, in Verve, we are celebrating 30 years of experience, but as you embark on the rest of 22, remember that the future experience is yours to create. Thank you.